I'm going to use the handheld mic because I have a hard time standing behind a podium. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Clay Morey. Uh, I'm no longer, what am I now? The chairman emeritus. I'm now chairman emeritus. Yeah, it sounds really old and not so much fun, right? Like, I don't even know what that means. Anyways, I, I was uh, one of the folks that co-founded Future Space Leaders uh, um, Foundation, uh, gosh, about 12 years ago, something like that, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, and uh, basically it was an effort with uh, me and a m bunch of my friends here in DC. Uh, we're trying to figure out how do we raise money to give grants to young professionals to attend space conferences internationally, particularly the IAC, um, the International Astronautical Congress that's hosted every year by the International Astronautical Federation, um, which I am now the president of, which is kind of amazing to me on a daily basis. My wife jokes, you know, so the IAF is the world's largest space organization. Uh, we have 478 members from 75 different countries, right? And uh, I'm, by the way, I'm one of the few Americans to have ever led this organization, and I think the first person from private industry to ever lead it. So it's usually a space agency leader or a deputy uh, leader from a space agency. Um, and about, gosh, Eight years ago, I got elected to the Bureau, which is the governing body for this organization. I became a vice president, and I started getting really involved. I had been volunteering for maybe a decade before that. Uh, and as I progressed through this thing as a VP, and then they asked me to be a special advisor and a chair of this and a chair of that, and look at the IEC evolution, I realized along the process that they were grooming me for something to be the president. And I, I, it kind of dawned on me about halfway through the process, like, oh, they want me to be the president of this organization. And so uh, I ran uh, in a contested election, which was kind of weird, uh, in, in Dubai. And I was elected uh, uh, basically about 18 months ago to be the president of the IAF. Um, and it's a, it's a really great organization, really great, uh, fun job. Uh, I have two other jobs. Uh, one is I'm the chief revenue officer of Voyager Space. Um, which is uh, about a four-year-old company, five-year-old company uh, that's bought up a bunch of other smaller space technology companies, and now we're putting those together. And uh, one of the things we're working on is building a space station called Starlab. So that's kind of my other job, is, is trying to put together the partnerships around Starlab. Uh, and so uh, I have kind of three hats, uh, but it's all fun, and it's a great industry work, and I've been doing this for about 25 years, and it's great to see so many friendly faces in the audience and, and, uh, and folks here. So a couple of things, and I'm going to digress for just a moment here at the start of my talk and talk about my OOTD. Who knows what an OOTD is? Raise your hand if you know what an OOTD is, right? All the young people do, all the old people don't know what an OOTD is. So I have a 20-year-old daughter. Uh, Callie, who goes to Bucknell, she's a rising junior at uh, Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, and uh, she wants to do finance, despite all my best efforts to get her into the space industry. She wants to go work on Wall Street, we'll see. Maybe someday she'll become a CFO of a space company, I don't know. Anyways, Callie goes to school, she sends uh, uh, my, my wife and I pictures of her OOTD. Stands for Outfit of the Day, by the way, for the older folks in the crowd. Outfit of the, the OOTD. So this morning I said, Callie, I'm going to this space conference on Capitol Hill. I'm going to talk to all these young people. What do I do for the OOTD? And she's like, well, what's your options, Dad? And I said, well, there's two. I can either go corporate cool or summer fun. And she's like, summer fun, summer fun. So I got to figure, did I get it? Did I get it right? It's summer fun. So I, and I have a Madras tie, which is originally from India. And we just signed for MOU for Star Lab with India with this one. So I'm, it's a little homage. And the only sidebar here is that um, people tell you dress for success, dress for the job you want to get, not the job you're in now. Um, you know, all these things. I say dress for fun, dress intentionally, and it's really about making yourself feel good and powerful, right? Like, now I feel confident. I got a good, I got a fire, as my daughter would say, it's fire, Dad. It's fire. <laughs> my son would say drip, but my daughter says fire, right? So this is the good thing about having two college students in the house. Uh, I digress. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this organization that I'm leading now, so what I, I want to talk to you guys for about, about 10, 10 minutes, and I can leave some time for Q&A, is about the International Astronautical Federation. What does it do? Uh, and, and as an organization, kind of what are the main tenets? What are we going after? Uh, and we do host this amazing conference, this International Astronautical Congress, every year. This year it's going to be in Baku, Azerbaijan, right? Which I had never heard of before they came and said, we want to host an International Astronautical Congress. A few years ago, they came to me and said, would you support this? And 
Okay. And so I started learning about Azerbaijan as a nation. By the way, it's in a tough neighborhood. Chechnya, Russia above, uh, Armenia to the west, Iran to the south, and Georgia is in there somewhere too. And then it's right on the Caspian Sea. So tough neighborhood, but Western ally, oil producing country, um, got there, uh, the country was basically set up, uh, gosh, less than 40 years ago, after the Soviet, uh, break up, Soviet Union broke up, um, they broke free, and now they're their own com country, and they're very proud of it, and they want to ally with the West and not, um, not with uh, some of the other countries in the region. And so they're very uh, close to Turkey um, and Turkic-speaking countries in the region. I, I, when I was there, so I went about a year ago, attended the F1 race, by the way, which was super fun. Um, in Baku, in the old streets of their downtown. Uh, and I was talking to the folks that were there and they said, uh, I said, well, what, are you Asian? Are you European? Are you Middle East? Like, what is it? And they're like, no, we're Caucasus. We're in the Caucasus region. We're Caucasus, just like you, they said to me. They're, we're just like you, we're Caucasian. I said, all right, now I get it. Okay. Uh, they are super happy and super proud to host this event. Um, we're trying to get people to come. Uh, Future Space Leaders is going to give foundation uh, grant money, basically, to have young people attend. I encourage you guys to, um, as you progress in your careers, to apply for these programs, to attend events like this. And there's lots of money out there from organizations like the Space Generation Advisory Council, like Future Space Leaders Foundation. Uh, the IAF itself has a, U a Young Space Leaders grant program. Um, that we do, and so there's lots of scholarships there. And by the way, if you're not a member of SGAC, it's free, join, right? It's a great international organization. The guys that started Planet all met through SGAC back in the day, so maybe you, you go to an SGAC event and you end up like starting a company that makes a lot of money at the end of the day, and so you, it's a good thing. Um, and what happens is when you go to these events, you meet people from all over the world. Space people like you're like, there's a space program in, I don't know, Ecuador? Right? And so it really opens doors. Um, you're going to make connections and have colleagues and friendships to last a lifetime. So I encourage you to go. Uh, and it's our flagship event. Now, the IAF also does other events that are out there, uh, global conference series. We do regional events. So we try to do not only these big, and by the way, the, the one we had last year in Paris, 9,000 people showed up for the, I, for the IEC which was record setting. Every year over the last 10 years, it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Some of that is due to good programming, good leadership. Some of it is due to uh, the fact that the space industry has been booming, right? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in, in my remarks here. But uh, the point is, go to these events, get involved, volunteer. Uh, a lot of these organizations are free. They're looking for people like you to, to energize their programming, to help volunteer and organize events. Uh, SJC is a great example. I work with them uh, to start an event with the satellite show that's here in the spring uh, every year in Washington. It's called SGX. It's like a TEDx for space. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for you to do stuff even domestically or at the Space Foundation's annual symposium event that they do in Colorado. So there's a lot of opportunities for young people to get involved. So it doesn't end with your Brookie thing or your Zed thing or your Sokowitz thing or your Future Space Leaders thing. It keeps going. There's all kinds of opportunities all the way up until you're 35 and then you turn into a pumpkin, and you're no longer considered a young professional. So I'm in that boat now. But it doesn't mean you still can't be involved, right? I'm still involved. So IF, let me go back to the IF for a second. So space used to be the purview of superpowers, right? United States, Soviet Union, bit China, Europe, somewhat, right? But the real capability was really a strategic capability of nation states, right? Or in the case of the Soviet Union, a lot of nations put together. And it was something that was very precious, right? And access to space was limited. And now, here we are 30 years later from when the Soviet Union broke up and we opened up access to space and now we have a ton of new investment that's coming into business where we're in a different, let's say, universe, if I could use the pun, um, where space is no longer the purview of superpowers. It's no longer the purview of big nations, wealthy nations, right? Uh, it is now the ability of a grade school to build a CubeSat and get a launch into space and actually be operating a satellite in space. Um, so we are in a very different world now in terms of the barriers to access space. And any of you guys, by the way, go to Small Satellite in Utah, also a super fun conference to go to. 
have no affiliation to it, but one of my favorite conferences out there. And you meet people from all over the world building CubeSats that they're going to put in space. And half of them are aerospace engineers that are frustrated and they say, I wish I was a double E. I wish I was an electrical engineer because I could really then figure out how to build a satellite. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, so purview of superpowers, now we have open access to space. So now we have tons of commercial companies that are merging in this sector. So show of hands, or well, not show of hands, but can somebody raise their hand and tell me who is the largest space actor in the world right now? Who's the largest space actor in the world? So SpaceX, the, the answer is, if you do it by number of satellites, number of launches, right? Um, what they're working on, so every, they've got programs in just about every field from national security, civil, commercial, right? They, um, they've deployed over 4,000 satellites that are in orbit. I don't even know the exact, every week it's like another batch of satellites goes up. They're launching at a faster cadence than any country in the world, right? And they're the largest player. Who do you think this, by, by number of satellites, who do you think the second largest is? Anybody know? OneWeb. OneWeb's the second. Planet's probably right up there with them, pretty close. Um, which just to show you, and Kuiper's coming, right? Project Kuiper's coming with Amazon. Give that a, a few more years, and they'll have tens of thousands, or not tens of thousands, but thousands of satellites in space. So we're in a different realm now where commercial companies are going to be the biggest users, uh, um, uh, uh, exploiters of space capability. And I, I used to give a, a talk, Brad Cheatham had me out to his class at uh, uh, CU Boulder, talk about space-based applications. And really space is, we think about space as something super exotic. We all love space, we all have passion for space. But really it's about delivering ones and zeros, right? It's digital information from space, from very high platform down to here on planet Earth, right? So it can be planet, which is doing Earth observation data. It can be communications, ones and zeros. It can be um, synthetic aperture radar. It can be climate data, right? So there's a whole host of things, and we're using this really unique vantage point in space, sometimes moving at 16,000 miles an hour, sometimes in a stationary orbit at GEO, um, to deliver this content and capability back to planet Earth. And commercial companies have now figured out how do, we, how do we do this in a way that's profitable? How do we use it to connect the world? How do we use it in ways to understand the planet? Um, and this is kind of a transformative thing. So you guys are living, what, the point here is you're living in an era where space is transforming from what was a very small club to a very big user community where it impacts your daily life. Now, I, I used to say all the time, everybody's got a, a, a cell phone in your, in your pocket, mobile device. You probably have four chips in there that connect the satellite networks right now. GLONASS, maybe Beidou, Galileo for sure, and GPS for sure. Right? So you already have everybody on the planet, and I put the number down here, I looked it up this morning, Hold on. 15 billion mobile devices on this planet. 15 billion, right? That's a lot. Way more than, you know, it's more than the people, obviously, right? There's 8 billion people, 15 billion mobile devices on the planet. So you think about the impact that space has on a daily life, on a daily basis with you guys, and you use it every day, even though you don't understand it, or maybe not even think about that you're using space. So. When I took over the presidency of the IAF, I was asked, you know, you need an agenda. So they had previous presidents that came before me had uh, done agenda items around what they call 3G diversity, uh, geography generation and gender equality, basically, and diversity in the IAF as an organization. So we're really trying to push to make it less uh, old white male guys like myself and get, try to get young people involved, try to get people involved from countries that are not uh, space players and, and get um, um, more diverse uh, from a gender standpoint uh, involvement in the organization. And that was great. And we're trying to in, 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 you know, put that into all of our program, all of our events. We do a lot of awards now. We do a lot of uh, make sure that we're intentional in terms of how we create panels uh, and speakers and, and making sure that we're diverse in all of these areas, that we get young people, we get um, diverse sets of folks from around the world, which is, by the way, not so easy because the space tends to be mostly European and U.S. And so it's, it's often hard to find people um, that we can actually get. And can they afford to come? If you want to bring somebody from Africa or Asia or other parts of the world, uh, in some cases we'll give scholarships to get those people there and, and actually have them come and be part of the dialogue. So um, 
it's, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. So I had to set up an agenda and I'm trying to look forward and I was sitting in Dubai and I was listening to all the panels and, and discussions that was going on around me and the number one thing that just kept coming up over and over again was sustainability. Sustainability, and sustainability means kind of two things when we talk about space. Uh, the first is sustainability in space. That is, how do we make sure the environment, there's lots of companies working on this stuff now, lots of agencies working on it. How do we make sure that we have an environment where um, we can operate up there, uh, where you have things like orbital debris, where you, you know, what we don't want to have is collisions in orbit, conjunctions as the DOD calls them, conjunctions, um, unplanned conjunctions. Uh, how do we do this? How do we create sustainability in space for all these actors now that we're going to go from, um, and by the way, about a decade ago, you had about a thousand active satellites in orbit. It's more than 10 times that now. More than 10 times. In, in one decade, we've gone from a thousand over 11, I think it's about 11,000 objects up there that are active, not just, you know, dead space rocket bodies, but active satellites, which is, again, incredible. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece is sustainability here on Earth. Right? So we use these ones and zeros that are coming from space to understand climate change, to have an impact, to be able to mitigate against climate change here on planet Earth. But we wouldn't understand the phenomena that we're uh, see seeing right now in weather and climate without that data that's coming from space. I have just hosted our first event that I was attended uh, about a month ago in Oslo, Norway. It was our first global conference uh, on climate change. Uh, from, from space, so it was uh, a space conference geared to that. And we had over 600 people come, uh, and the, the government of Norway was awesome. It's interesting, right, so oil, but most of their money comes from, right, from oil, from petroleum, but they're super focused on climate. And by the way, I've seen the future, and the future is Norway. Uh, the future is Norway, it is uh, like 90% electric cars when you're there, and it's super quiet when you're on the streets, like in the middle of a city, and you're, and you're like, wow. And it's because you don't hear any of that engine noise. And it's clean, because you don't have the exhaust pollution. Um, it was really very interesting. It's also light until like midnight, which is, yeah, interesting. But uh, they're super focused on this. And so it was a great conference. Um, we're getting output that comes out of that. And we're gonna try to actually influence the COP proce process that, that takes place with all these other countries that we're trying to feed uh, space data sets and space climate information back into the, um, the larger COP process to understand what's happening on here on planet Earth. And so that was great. And we had great participation from NOAA and NASA that came and spoke at the event, and that was super. And we're hopefully going to repeat that, um, that what we call the GLOC. Uh, the acronyms kill me, uh, the European acronyms, the global, global, I don't know, climate change. I don't know where they get GLOC out of it, but it's the Global Space Conference on Climate Change. Uh, there's also the GLEX and the GLOSS, and, the, and so next year we do one on security uh, called the GLOSS, and then we're gonna do a GLEX after that, which is on exploration. So you, you kind of get the G and the L, and then they put something else after it. It's a constant, it's a running joke with me and the staff there. I don't understand it. Uh, so, uh, so that's one. Second piece, second piece of the equation after you get from sustainability is investment, right? And just, a, a, again, a couple of numbers for you here. So, Space economy right now is valued, uh, a couple different sources, uh, peg it at about $3 trillion. $3 trillion space economy. Now, I used to do statistics back when I was in the U.S. Department of Commerce over 20, I, Patricia, I don't know how many years ago it was, a long time ago. Patricia Cooper and I used to, uh, she, she was the satellite person, I was the launch guy, and we used to do something called the U.S. Industrial Outlook which was a big, it was like a phone book size publication came out from the Commerce Department every year and people actually used this information on Wall Street and other places to make decisions. So we were, we took it pretty seriously, right? And so we would track all the data on satellites and on launches around the world and Patricia left to go work for Pan Amsat. I took her job so I started tracking satellite data and I don't think we came anywhere close to $3 trillion, Patricia. I don't think we were even close on those numbers. Yeah, not even $100 billion, I don't think, at that point. So. Um, $9 billion was invested in space in 2021. We've had over $20 billion in private capital to date invested in space. Probably the bulk of it's coming from SpaceX and Blue Origin. Yeah, Bezos is putting in over a billion a year. Elon's out raising a ton of money. That's kind of his superpower. Um, so it's, it's, it's gonna come and it's gonna continue. We also see a lot of money now coming into smaller companies, to venture, venture funds and angel investors that are coming in with smaller companies. And a lot of these uh, investors that come into the space business do not understand the long time horizons. They don't understand the technologies that they're investing in. They don't understand how these technologies take time sometimes to um, 
you know, be put into, put into place and actually monetized in space. And so we're trying to figure out another plank within the IF now is that how do we educate investors in this area? How do we keep attracting capital into the business? How do we keep the momentum going for space? And then how do we educate these investors? And so we're working on that as our, our second piece. I'm not gonna start a conference series on that because there's a lot of conferences on investment, but we're gonna try to put this into the rest of our programming for the IF. Um, and the third piece is um, spa security, uh, space security. And when I say space security, I'm not talking about militarizing, militarizing space, right? Um, uh, there's lots of entities, and I think we have like several here in the United States that do this stuff, pay attention to every day. What I'm trying to figure out is how do we have norms uh, of operation, best practices, how do we have a place where all of these commercial actors and government actors can coexist in a space and you think about it like on the high seas, and there's a lot of parallels between law of the sea and space law, Diane, you could opine on that probably for a while. Uh, and so what we're trying to figure out is how do we get all these actors in the room to talk to each other about this? And so there are other forms for this, but the IF is a bit unique. As I said, we have 75 countries involved. We have countries from, uh, again, that have CubeSat programs all the way up to superpower nations. And what we wanna do is be able to have dialogue around these topics to make sure that uh, and there's a ton of efforts. I, I think even King Charles did the Astra Carta a week ago. There's three or four different efforts right now that are, that are geared towards this idea of, of space sustainability in space, uh, this other piece of it. But how do we have best practices? How, how do we have norms of behavior that, that we look to operate securely and safely together in space? And so that's the third plank of what we're trying to do. And we are gonna do a, secure, um, spa uh, a space security uh, event in Tel Aviv next year um, in Israel for the IF. So those are my three main agenda items. Um, it's super fun to do it. Um, my advice to you guys, and Bob Caban, I thought, by the way, I was sitting in the back room and listening to Bob Caban, I'm like, oh, those are all the things I always say when I you know, get involved, volunteer, walk through the door, accept the job, work hard, do your best. Like, it does work out, by the way. Um, so it's all good advice that Bob said. But um, I always say, when I'm talking to young professionals, uh, you know, volunteering is like the funnest, it's the best, right? Volunteer, get involved. If you're not getting involved, you're not doing something right. So get involved, volunteer. You're gonna get back way more than you put into it. So thanks for organizing. Thanks for hosting me today. Now, do I just introduce Diane now or do I take questions? What do I do? I got a couple minutes. So I got five minutes. I can take questions from the floor and then I get the pleasure of introducing my favorite space lawyer, Diane Howard. Any questions? Sure. Yeah, so I, uh, you know, somebody was talking about the Apollo generation. I'm like, I barely remember Apollo, right? Like, I was super young. Um, Challenger for me is what I remember. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I hope we don't have another Challenger moment. Um, uh, but how do we prevent flight? So a couple things, I think. One is um, what we saw in the last few years is a lot of these special purpose acquisition corporations, these SPACs that, were, that got into the space business, and they invest a lot of money um, because there was access to this capital and it was kind of go-go, and now we're seeing the aftermath of that, which is uh, a ton of people lost money, right? If you look at the valuations of some of these SPACs that got it, people got into technologies they didn't understand, they were looking for a quick growth, they were perhaps looking at SpaceX as a, as a, as a value proposition and thinking this was a, a good way to invest. And so my, my concern goes around that, which is you've got, again, investors that come in that don't understand or know what are they actually investing in? What is the growth? How long does it take to invest? So education's a big piece of that. Um, as, a, as an industry, uh, you know, we have to actually execute on some of these things, right? And so um, it's hard, right? Like uh, I saw a story this week, you know, I used to work for Blue Origin. Blue Origin just lost an engine on a test stand. You hope that that reaction isn't taken the wrong way, right? Like people blow up hardware all the time. You know, Elon's, uh, you know, kind of magic, again, is this kind of fail forward approach, right? Test, fail, push it to the limit, blow it up, and then finally you're gonna get something that works and you can feel that's a deployable uh, uh, asset. So do people understand that? I think people have come more and more to understand that. Um, 
you know, I, I think, and I don't want to speak, I didn't work for SpaceX, but like, you know, SpaceX looked, tried for a long time to land on the damn platform, and they kept blowing stuff up, and for a while, they didn't want to talk about it. And then they put out like a, a reel of videos showing like <laughs> rockets blowing up, and it was kind of, you know, look how hard this is, and look at, and then finally you stick the landing, and wow, you know, it's like, you know, 10, <laughs> right? Uh, so I, you know, there's a piece of that, you know, it's that, I don't know that I have a specific answer to your question other than educate, uh, make sure that people understand it, and execute, um, and you know, countries, I think, I think on a national level here in the United States and, and around the world, I was just in India uh, five weeks ago, and you know, India, by the way, same amount of people that work at NASA work for ISRO, their space agency, in India. You know what their budget is for India? 1.7 billion. You know what the budget of NASA is? It's about what, 24, 25 billion dollars? Same amount of people. India has a launch program, like three different launch vehicles, PSLV, SSLV, GSLV, Mark III. They have a satellite program, they do Earth observation, they have a, a GSAT and INSAT um, programs for satellites, and now they're doing a human spaceflight program on $1.7 billion a year. It's like amazing, which tells you they're competitive on cost, price, right? Like their salaries are way below what ours are. But they have a very mature industry. Um, so if you see a country like India, which has a whole host of other challenges they're facing, now investing heavily in space and sees the information economy, sees the engineering economy tied back to space and what space brings to it, those are awesome things. And I think it goes to the point, right? Everybody's gonna ask you, well, why do we spend money on space? We shouldn't, we shouldn't be spending on my space. We should spend our money on, pick a, pick a subject, right? Um, education, healthcare, whatever. We, the, the answer is you gotta do both, right? And, and, and I always point to India and I say, look, India's doing it. Absolutely, we need to do it here in the US. We need to lead. So at, as long as countries see the value of this and keep investing in it as nations, I think we're gonna be okay. It's the individual guys, it's the private capital guys. And again, I, I think the good news is that Elon and Jeff understand the value proposition of space and are trying to get there and actually further the goals for humanity. So going to space to benefit life on Earth. I think we're gonna be okay. But to your point, we could, we could have something that collides that has unintended consequences. That's like not a scenario I wanna think about, but we probably should think about it, right? Best, best is to, to do the preventative side. Other question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And um, the being I am professional, uh, one of my goals uh, to achieve in life is to be able to bring a space, space program to the world. And I feel like, you know, since it's somebody who has extensive experience being in the industry and uh, who's on the forefront of leading and looking at the landscape uh, over the last few years, um, what would you say are some of the best practices that you've seen in emerging countries that have emerging space programs? And, you know, some of the best practices that you've seen leaders implement in order to, no pun intended, take off yeah. <laughs> the space program. To it's a great question to do, thank you. Um, you know, we were talking about this at the IF about how do we get countries that have kind of you know, gotten over the, the initial, like the ramp up, you know, that have taken it from like zero to, and there's other countries in the region, you know, that um, Saudi Arabia is one that's you know, trying to ramp up there. They just, established, they went from a commission to an agency, I think it's about 200 people now, but they have great ambitions. It's not easy, right, like to ramp. Um, so there's a knowledge base, um, a lot of the challenges that people face is they send their young people to engineering programs in Europe and the US and they don't come back, right? So I was talking to, in Ecuador, um, a couple of young engineers and they try really hard to get people to come back. I went to an event in Panama earlier this year and they've got a program they're like, we will pay for you to go to grad school in the US, but then you gotta come back and right, start to develop a space industry here in country, right? Um, which can be, by the way, it doesn't have to be rockets and satellites right out the box, it can be ones and zeros and how to use them for agriculture or forestry or climate or there's fisheries. There's all kinds of stuff you can do with space, right? That is a lot lower barriers to entry, let's say on the technology front. So, um, so there is no, uh, we were, I was talking with Patricia about this at lunch a couple weeks ago about in the telecommunications sector, there's like a whole like system about how do you teach other countries how to build a regulatory environment around telecommunications to actually get a, a vibrant telecommunications comp, uh, um, industry developing. We don't have that in space, maybe yet. We don't have it yet, but we need it. We could, maybe a little bit. Diane's doing this to me. We, 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 so, so, but to your point, there's no, I don't know that there's necessarily a blueprint. What, what I'd like to see is 
some of the countries that have started to field programs, UAE would be probably an example, uh, United Arab Emirates would be one to mentor other, right? Like, um, you know, South Africa's got a, a burgeoning program, Turkey, Azerbaijan is trying to start one, Azerocosmos, which was started as a satellite operator and now wants to be a space agency, or is a space agency, and now they're trying to figure out how to field programs. Um, it's a multifaceted problem from the engineering, the brain power to do it, and then the investment in country, and what are you gonna pick for the areas you're gonna go after, and then how do you develop those key technologies? What, what do you wanna play in? What's good for you know, the local, you know, if, it's, if it's something like agricultural based, for instance, you know, how do you do that? Um, and you know, I've been uh, heartened by that when you, come, when you go to some of these events, right? Like when we went to the UAE and we saw all the young, particularly women, right? Like turn out brilliant young women engineers that like are super excited to work in space. So I think there's the, the, the talent base, right? But building all that around it, it's gonna, it takes a lot. So we probably need a better blueprint and we probably need something akin to, uh, what, what was it called for the ISTA, what was it? What's the organization for that, that teaches people on the telecommunication? USTTI, we need a USTTI for space. Somebody's gotta start that. Anybody in here wanna start that? Figure it out. Other questions? Yes, one? All right, I gotta introduce that, Diane, sorry. You can grab me afterwards and at the, go to the reception tonight at, at Voyager Space's rooftop. So it's my pleasure now 